That was good. That's good. Hey, many, 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 man. Nashville, Tennessee has never turned out anything. Good as that, amen. I know you made some of you mad, I'm sure, but that's all right. Turn to the Song of Solomon, would you please, with me, chapter number one. Song of Solomon, chapter one. Verse one. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Father, bless this book now. Lord, anoint the word of God as it goes forth for the purpose you intended. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Song of Solomon is pretty well considered to be written by Solomon. Solomon the king, son of David. Solomon that God granted great wisdom, riches, power, notoriety, fame. Solomon was well known so far as the queen of Sheba that came from the south and said the half has not been told. Solomon in his day therefore ranks above essentially anyone else on this globe when it comes to a personal type understanding and relationship with God. Because Solomon here, if he wrote this book, and he more than likely did, wrote it about 945, 950 BC, which would put it 3,000 years ago. When was the last time you read anything 3,000 years old? Think about it for a moment. Think about that. And all you have to do is go home, open it up, and you can read literature that is unsurpassed today in its beauty, its content, its structure. The Song of Solomon is a remarkable book. A lot, of, uh, a lot of preachers will not preach from the Song of Solomon. I understand why. It has passages in it that definitely get into the issue of, of, uh, of, uh, of the love of a man for a woman. And it, uh, it uses terminology you won't find anywhere else in the Bible. But the purpose of that is to teach a lesson. This is used as a typology of the great love that Christ has for his bride. Keep in mind that the bride is the major theme that runs through the Song of Solomon and the word love shows up over and over and over and over and over again. There is no one that can make a marriage and heal a marriage like the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows all about it, believe me. And the Song of Solomon is written to teach us some great lessons as it relates to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, the whole family of God is large. All those saints that were before the flood, the saints that were after the flood, then the saints that'll come in the tribulation period and the millennium. But his bride is one, it says in the Song of Solomon. She is unique and different from every other uh, entity, the, the family of God that has ever or ever will exist. The Bible says all the time will come when all things will be gathered together in Christ. We understand that because he's the second Adam. Without him, there is no future. So all will be gathered together in Christ. But the relationship that we have with him right now is unique and it's special. It's a personal relationship unparalleled in any Old Testament saint or any that follows because we are his bride and his bride is one. He will not have another bride. There will not be two or three brides. It will be this one bride. And when he makes up that bride and the last one is part of that body of Christ, the bride of Christ, then we will enter into a different era, a different dispensation, a different time. So the Song of Solomon is loaded with lessons that we can learn, things that we can take into our heart and into our soul and begin to meditate upon these things. Some scripture is written that you meditate upon it, you think on it, you take it home and you pray over it and you ask God to give you the, to give you the, the, the understanding of the text. When when David was an old man, his body could not retain heat. So the Bible said they took a young fair maiden, her name was Abishag, and she slept with David, but they had no physical relationship. She was simply there to keep his body warm. When David died, uh, one of his sons went after her because he thought, now if I have her, then I can take over the kingdom, but not so. But there are those who believe that the Shulamite that's mentioned here in the Song of Solomon was Abishag the Shunammite. Now we don't know that, we can't prove a lot of things you take by conjecture, but it may very well be true that Abishag is the Shulamite that's mentioned here. That's really not all that important because if she is, she simply 
a type of what's going to happen in the future and what's happening right now. For those of you that have been born again, for those of you that are not simply religious, raised in religious atmosphere, religious culture and all of that, but you do know the Lord Jesus Christ in a special way, a personal way, a way, my friend, where your heart and your soul is attached to him, then you'll begin to understand some of the great truths that come forth from the Song of Solomon. Books like this are written to establish you, ground you in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what the Song of Solomon is all about. First of all, the Bible says in chapter number one and verse number four, look what it says, draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. This is where he found her. He found his bride. He went out looking for her. And this is exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing today. He comes into this world and he is searching for the bride. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 32 and verse 10, he found me in a desert land, in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. There is no room when you're full of the Holy Spirit of God for any other God. He made him round the high, right on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. He made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil, out of the flinty rock from places unknown, inaccessible. He can feed you. He can give you that which the world cannot touch. They have no access to it. But boy, can he feed you. Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 6 says this, And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. All it takes is the command. The word is pregnant with power and life and ability. And what you're hearing me say to you this morning, from the word of the living God, Forget me, it's the word that comes forth and that word is loaded with absolute power and authority. Latch on to it and you'll be amazed. How many of you remember when he passed by you? Do you remember where he found you? Don't ever let it slip from your mind. There was a place, there was a time when he found you. But don't ever forget it, but don't live in it. It is in the past. Set your affections on things above. Point to the future, for there's a day coming for you that God will bless. So he found me, and then the Bible said he loved me. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number two and verse number four, now look at this. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. He wanted to show her off, amen. Yes, he did. His bride, the apple of his eye, the one he called, he loved her with an everlasting love. Look what it says in Song of Solomon 6 and verse number 8. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. See them? All these other, all these other, but that's not the bride. Chapter number 6 and verse number 9. My dove, my undefiled is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her, blessed her, yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. There's something about her that's different from all of the others. Those of you that are married today, do you understand that God gave you a special relationship with another person where you can look deep into their soul, where you can communicate on a level that you can't with anyone else? Do you understand that you have a love for your husband or for your wife that is altogether different from any other love on the face of this earth? Amen. You understand that you love your children, you love your parents, you love your friends, you love and that's all great and it's all good. But it is not the love that a man has for his wife and it's not the love that a wife has for her husband. Husband. That's a binding love. It's a powerful love. It's a love that is strong as death. It says in the Song of Solomon, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. You can mess with his riches. You can mess with his home. You can mess with this and mess with that. But don't mess with his wife amen. or husband. Amen. amen, amen, and amen. So the Song of Solomon, my dove, my undefiled is but one. Not two, not three, not four. There'll only be one bride of Christ. 
Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3 says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. You ever remember that drawing power? Do you remember when your soul was first stirred? Do you remember when you began to think about spiritual things? Do you remember when the light began to flood into your heart and you began to realize how lost, how dead, how dark that your world really is? And then God begins to introduce you to something far, far greater than anything that you'd ever known in this world? That is the drawing power of the Holy Ghost of God. That word kindness, loving kindness, is the Hebrew word chesed. And it means kindness, loving kindness, steadfast love, unfailing love. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Those of you that laugh and scorn at love is because you've never known love. You live in a generation of people that are searching, looking, hunting, buying, trying, and they don't know what they're looking for. What they really need is real love. Once that ever wraps itself around your heart, you'll never be the same. If you've ever had someone love you and you've lost them, you've lost a great thing indeed. If you've ever loved someone and you've lost them, then you have truly lost something indeed. Don't ever let yourself be fooled into thinking that you need to love yourself. That's garbage straight out of the pit of hell. Amen. Put your, set your love on Christ and the Lord Jesus. Ephesians chapter number three and verse seven says, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now listen to this. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now watch this. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, by the one body of Christ, by his love, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We serve an al almighty, absolute, eternal being. And this eternal purpose, therefore, has no beginning and it has no ending. Therefore, God's mind, the mind of God, has created all of this and it will one day bring glory to him. But right now, to the spiritual entities out there that are watching, to those who are conscious of the power and they're conscious of the conflict, they understand what the, what the stakes are for. They're watching the body of Christ and they're being amazed at what he's doing right now in the body of Christ. How many hold what I'm trying to say this morning? There's only one body. You say, preacher, the church is dying. Well, let it die. But the body of Christ will never die. Let it die and get rid of it. Sweep the garbage away because the body of Christ will be purified through everything that you see happen. The, the faith will be stronger. The walk will be better. And our love for him will be even greater than it is now. Amen. Don't fret yourself over that. Don't you worry one minute about the church dying. Oh, no. Upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, how it moves your soul, how it stirs your heart when you have real, true fellowship with a real, true believer in Christ. Don't you get sick up to here with religion? Aren't you sick up to here with this American Christianity? Aren't you fed up with it? But true faith in Christ draws us together with bonds that cannot be broken. Amen. Some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. You know why? You're part of American religion. You got an hour for God on Sunday morning and that's all he's getting. <laughs> he brings me into this world, his world. The Song of Solomon chapter number two and verse number 14. Oh, my dove, thou art in the cliffs of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice for sweet is thy voice and thy countenance comely. Take us the foxes. The little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, 
and I am his. One of the things about the Song of Solomon is who's talking. Sometimes a sentence will start, but before it ends, you have two different people talking. They respond to each other. So you've got to read it carefully and pray over what you're reading. Now look carefully at this. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine. This is her talking to him. She calls him her beloved. Every time you see beloved show up in the Song of Solomon, it is the Shulamite talking to her love, to her, bro, to her husband, to her love. My beloved is mine and I am his. I think there's a song about that. I am his and he is mine. You ever heard that one? I am his and he is mine. Oh yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I love it. Let me get to it. Here we are. God's amazing grace sent down from heaven, rescued me from death and from shame, opened up mine eyes and brought salvation. Now I'm his, praise his holy name. Tis so sweet to know I have Jesus with me. He will keep me from sin and from strife. He delivered me from condemnation. Now I have eternal life. Here's the chorus. Now I know that he is mine and I'm his forever. He is leading me along his way. He'll be holding to my hand when I cross death's river. He will take the sting of death away. Amen. When I draw my last breath here, I take hold of that hand and out of here I leave. Amen. Woo, what does the world have to give you? <laughs> like they say, suck it up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you suck it up. You suck it up when you're throwing it at somebody else. When it comes back to you, ain't no sucking done then, buddy. That's been my experience with watching this bunch of philosophy that's coming out from that place. Amen. So he is mine and I am his. But don't you notice something about this? The Bible said he feedeth among the lilies. That's quite remarkable. The Bible's quite a thing. You know that? It's quite a book. A Song of Solomon chapter number five and verse number one says this. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse, I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, yea, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. He's in his garden. His garden is a beautiful place. His garden has beautiful smells, aroma. His garden is a place of protection. His garden is a place of feeding. His garden is a place of security. And he speaks to her from his garden and says, I'm in my garden. And then he comes to her house. Look at this, verse two. I sleep, she's speaking now, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew. My locks were the drops of the night. I've put off my coat. How shall I put it on? See, she responds now. I put my coat off. How shall I respond or how shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them? And my, 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 how true this is. My beloved put his hand to the hole of the door and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. He came to her for fellowship. He came to her for love. He came to her for what only she could respond with. He had made her his bride. He loved her with an everlasting love. He came to that door hungry for the time that he would spend with her. But instead, she's concerned more with temporal nothingness. Temporal nothingness. Nothing, you know. Sweet nothings, they talk about. And instead of coming to him when he wanted fellowship, she turned away. And then her heart smote her because she has something inside her that says to her, you know what fellowship is. You know what it is to walk with him. You know what it is to talk to him. You know what it is for the Holy Spirit to move in your heart. If you don't know that, folks, I can't, there's nothing I can say to you this morning. And Lord God knows I'm not trying to be better than anybody, but I know when the Holy Ghost moves in my soul, I know what that feels like. 
There's no feeling on this earth better than that. That's a wondrous thing. And yet he walks away. She goes to the door, touches the knob, her myrrh on her hands. It drips from her hands. That's his calling card. He left it for her. He reminds her, I came and you didn't want to listen. He may move in this house this morning. He may come to you, knock on your door, come to your heart and tell you how long has it been since you talked to the Lord? How long has it been? My friend, how long has it been? How long has it been since he'd first place in your life? Instead of giving him lip service, why don't you give him knee service? Instead of playing with God, why don't you invite him back into where he was before in the power of the Holy Spirit of God? Because you live by that or die by that. There is, a, there is nobody on this earth more miserable than a backslidden Christian. Amen. Amen. How do you know, preacher, I've been there. <laughs> Amen. I speak first person. You can't be happy. You're fidgety. You're short of temper. Uh, you, sometimes you can't even sleep. You trot around. You pace in the house. And you, and you think the world's against you. And you wonder what happened to God. And the reason for that is because you're out of fellowship with the Lord. How do I get back in fellowship with the Lord? Come back to where you left him. Come back and get on your knees and start talking to him. He brings me into his world. He feeds among the lilies. Song of Solomon chapter 8 verse number 13. She learned her lesson. Look at this. Solomon chapter 8 verse 13. Thou that dwellest in the gardens. The companions hearken to thy voice. Cause me to hear it. Thou that dwellest in the gardens is the Shulamite. She said I'm out. I'm coming back and I'm staying there. He loves his gardens and that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be where things grow. I'm going to be where you can smell life. I'm going to be where the sun shines. I'm going to be in a place where I can walk in fellowship with God. Getting tired of dead, rotting flesh. Turn your TV set on. Amen. If you could only see physically what's being dumped in your house. Pure, really. I mean pure garbage. Sewage. It gets worse by the year. Yet they make it look good. And if you don't buy it and don't accept it and don't bring it in your embrace, embrace it, you're a bigot. Yeah. All right. You're a misogynist or they, if, if anything, everything's racism today. Yeah. You know, you're out of date. You're anachronistic. You're bad. You're, you're this, you're that. They got every name in the world to hang on you yeah. because you don't march to their tune. You don't walk with their walk and you don't buy it. And folks, until I draw my last breath by the grace of God, hang all those monikers on me because I'm every one of them. I don't belong to that crowd. I quit eating sewage when I got saved in 73. I got my head out of the hog trough. I got tired of hearing the oink oink and all the slopping and going on around me. Some of you... They say that a hog will eat good grain, it'll eat, uh, it'll eat corn, it'll eat good stuff, till you start feeding it slop. And then once that hog gets, gets starts, you start feeding that hog slop, that's all it wants is slop. Am I right? <laughs> I never did raise many hogs, I'm telling you. I'm not a hog farmer. But I'll tell you the truth, folks. You understand what you're eating, what you're taking in, because that makes all the difference in who you are. He loves gardens. The Garden of Eden, you remember it? The word Eden means delight. There'll be a second Garden of Eden. Revelation chapter number 22. What was lost in that first garden was gained back in that second garden. It was at the Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord Jesus Christ said, not my will, but thine be done. What was lost there at Eden was gained back at Gethsemane. Eden means delight. Gethsemane means olive press. Pressing olive is a type of life. The olive oil is a type of the uh, olive tree is a type of the tree of life. And olive oil is a type of life, the oil of unction. And so it was being squeezed out. One life replaced with another one. And that's what happened at Gethsemane. <coughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ there gave himself totally and completely to us. He comes for me. Song of Solomon chapter number 2. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. 
The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs. And the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. What time of the year is this? Well, it's spring. What time of the year are we in? We're headed right now for the, for the spring equinox. Just a few days. Spring. It's quite remarkable, too, because abib in the Hebrew means time of budding, bringing forth the bud. God said to them, he said, this is the beginning of months for you, not Janus, the pagan calendar. He said, it's springtime. And he said, it's then when I'll give you the Passover. It's then when your days will start. He said, you're different. He said, don't count your time after them. Don't count the stars after them. He said, don't be dismayed by the stars of the heavens. I made all of it. And it's all made for the glory of God. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> I don't know how long it's been since I sang Old Lang Syne. I'd say it's been at least 60 years. <laughs> and of course, when I sang it back then, I couldn't sing any better back then than I can now. Amen. All right. Finally, in John chapter number 14, he comes to take me where he is. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Personal, direct to his bride. Yes, he's coming again. I got on the internet, and you get a lot of takes on this, but Jewish brides are close in typology to what the, to what the Bible is all about. A man by the name of Arnold Fluchtenbaum. I have some of his books. He's a Jewish scholar. He got saved. But he says that a Jewish web wedding falls down into these categories. First, the arrangement. The arrangement, okay? The first stage of the Jewish wedding system is the arrangement. The father of the bridegroom and the father of the bride arrange the wedding. A bride price is paid. And according to Fluchtenbaum, the case of the bride of Christ, the price was the blood of his son. Yes. Christ loved us. He loved the church and gave himself for it. The church. So the arrangement was thus sealed with blood. Then there's the preparation. The second stage is the preparation. It covers the period of betrothal, which could last for a minimum of a year or a longer time. During this time, the bride's prepared and trained to take on the role of a wife, and her purity is observed. Paul writes, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I spoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a pure Virgin, chaste virgin to Christ, amen. His love is just one. And then the third stage, the fetching of the bride. The third stage of the Jewish wedding system, the fetching of the bride. The groom would go to the house of the bride on the wedding day to fetch her to his home. God will announce this event with a shout and a trumpet blast in the Christ, and Christ will appear in the atmospheric heavens to fetch the, his church, his body, his bride. And that's what I'm listening for. Amen. Did you hear it? There's no greater sound. Wouldn't it be something if you heard, come up hither. Amen. Before the sun goes down, come up hither. Then it's all over with in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. No time to change anything. No time to pray. No. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. They say the twinkling of an eye in this text means that light traveling at 186,000 miles a second, that's how fast they say it travels, hits the back of your eyeball and comes back out at the front, bounces in and out. The time it takes for that bolt of light in and out, 186,000 miles a second, is the twinkling of an eye. Now, how much can you get done that fast? You better be ready. In such an hour as you think not. Then there's the ceremony. It takes place privately in the home of the bridegroom and is not the wedding feast, but rather the marriage ceremony. Perhaps one can add the believers who died prior to Pentecost likely attend this wedding. Oh, they'll be there. All the family of God will be there. The queens, the concubines, all of them, they'll all be there. And they'll marvel when the marriage of the Lamb takes place. Now, why is that necessary, preacher? I want you to look at the last part of your Bible, the book of Revelation, see if I can find it here. Here it is. Here's why that I think. That the marriage is so important. Chapter 2, chapter 21, rather, verse 2. Revelation 21, 2. 
And now John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither. I'll show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now look at verse 17. And the spirit and the who? That puts you right up there with him asking them to come. That puts you in a spiritual position. That's what that means. If you suffer with him, you'll reign with him. Right now, for 2,000 years, making up his body, the bride of Christ, he has been preparing those who will reign with him for 1,000 years on this earth. Amen. Not Old Testament saints, not tribulation saints, but church age, born again believers. That's who you are. You're the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the last thing he says is, the spirit and the bride say come. Now, what have you done with it? That's the question. What have you done? What have you done of all this privilege you have? What have you done with it? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Have you hunger for the Lord? It ought to make you hunger more. Do you know what? You know what Peter said about Lot? He said the filthy conversation of the wicked vexed his righteous soul. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now we know Lot. The Bible says that when it, these angels appeared and said, we're going to, he said, we well, get out of here because we're going to burn this place. Lot tried to test witness to his sons-in-laws. And the Bible says that they said, to, they, they thought, you're, you're mocking. They considered him as one that mocked because he'd never said anything spiritual to them before. Mocked. Yet the apostle Peter said, the filthy conversation of the wicked vexed his righteous soul. So even in his backslidden condition, he was still head and shoulders above the filth and perversion that was around him. Is that where you are today? I hope you are. I hope you're not moved from that position. Now I want to give you this warning and then I'll close. Watch carefully. Be very careful of any so-called spiritual movement that takes place today when they elevate sodomy. And at the same time, they appear to be Bible believers preaching and ministering the Word of God. Watch it. Watch it. And you're seeing it. I've already seen it. And that's why I'm warning you today. Watch it. When they elevate sodomy and put them as leaders. Now, sodomy, listen. It tickled me to death. Half this church filled full of homosexuals. It wouldn't bother me one bit. Witches on one side and homosexuals on the other. Come on in, sit down. But they'll never be in a leadership position. That's the key. They will never be in leadership. We've had sodomites come to temple, folks. While I was in the hospital, we had two join up back there that I was told about, and I didn't know anything about it. They've come, and we've had Satanists and witches. The Word of God, with this place open to Word of God's preached, that's the only help, the hope they've got. But they will never be put in leadership position. They'll never be projected before the people as a sound Christian witness and doctrine. That's not going to happen because that's wrong. Amen. It's wrong. It's dead wrong. There's no way in the world that you can embrace that and say that you're a Bible believer preaching the word of God. But welcome, you're welcome. Believe me, you are. So be careful. Watch what I'm saying. It's happening. It's happening right now. While you're sitting there, it's happening. And it comes across as some kind of a great spiritual movement and they're projecting sodomy before the people. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we have in your house this morning. I hope something I said is helpful to somebody, struck a chord in their heart, turned a little light on in their soul, spoke to them, Heavenly Father, where they definitely need to be spoken to, bring some comfort, some conviction, whatever you do. Lord, you know, all the different people in this house, every, every last one of them have a different situation. They have a different need. Some of them need to repent. They need to turn from sin. They're falling into gross sin. They're far away from you, and it's dragging them further down. And if they've been truly born again, it's going to drag them down to the sin and to death, and they will die. Father, I pray for them. And I pray for that one in the house this morning, never been born again. I pray for light to come into their soul. 
I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to them and draw them by Christ and by your word. In thy name I pray. And when the heads are bowed, nobody looking. Anybody raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher, don't you pray for me because what you said is true. You spoke the truth. And I will speak the truth. God bless you. God bless you. God bless every one of you. Just raised your hand. Folks, I'm too old to mess around. I got, I got nobody. I don't care about joining anybody. I know the truth and I'm going to preach the truth until I'm gone from here. And I preach to you the truth this morning. Anybody raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. Anybody, pray for me. God bless you, folks. Hands up everywhere in the house. Thank the good Lord. Thank the Lord. Father, bless these folk who raise their hand. Bless them, Holy One. We send forth the Holy Spirit of God. Pray for unction and anointing. We pray to help them. Raise them up, Father, by your truth, by the light, by the unction, the anointing, and point them to the Lord Jesus Christ, the only hope, the only Savior there is. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand up this morning.